Hi folks, welcome to our Bible study, uh, devotional Bible study today. I do refer to it as a devotional Bible study because it's obviously not academic. It's obviously just to bring a blessing. So welcome to our devotional Bible study today. And uh, we're going to be looking at Ephesians 3 verses 6 to 13. So let me read it to you from the NIV. It says this. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. Father, when we read your word together, we know that the mystery that's contained, the mystery of life, spiritual life, that's contained within, needs to be revealed to us. And we need your Holy Spirit to be able to see it and to understand it and appropriate it as our own. So, Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit today that will come and help us in this short devotional time to understand something of the mystery of Christ Jesus that will release us and bring us freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, in the Old Testament period, the Jewish people were the instruments through which God revealed himself to the world. They were God's chosen people. Mistakenly, they believed that they were exclusively the people of God and that God had no interest in the Gentiles or in all other non-Jewish people. However, Paul identifies this mistake and reveals the heart of the mystery in verse 6 to 8. The Jewish people thought that their relationship with God was like this. Mike has a younger brother, Eric, and a friend, John, who lives next door. John would come to Mike and Eric's house to play, but Mike would latch on to John and the two of them would run away from Eric and hide just as fast as they could. He would try to run after them, but was too slow and could never catch them. That way, Mike got to play with John all by himself. He wanted John to be his friend exclusively, but Eric wanted him to be their friend inclusively. Paul explains that the Jewish people had it all wrong. God is not anyone's friend exclusively. His intention from the very beginning was that he wanted to have a relationship with all people inclusively. God's intentions are very clear in verse 6. There are three strands of relationship that we have with God. Heirs together speaks of having the same inheritance as the Jewish people. Members together speaks of belonging to the same family as the Jewish people. Share us together, speaks of having the same privileges as the Jewish people. You know, I've never understood anti-Semitism. I drove through South End Seafront the other day, and it was very obviously full of Jewish people. And when I looked at them, I smiled, and some of them smiled back, but some of them looked a bit confused, as if they were not expecting a smile, as if they were expecting something else. I don't know if I look particularly thuggish or something like that, but at the end of the day, I think God loves Jewish people. I think God loves Gentile people. I think God loves all people together and wants them to be saved. And I guess that I would base that thought on a scripture like we've read today. Jesus is the friend of sinners. And as Paul says, I am chief amongst them. For me, that whole thing about having Jewish blood is really fascinating. But I don't think it gives you extra privileges. I think in the end, you still need to believe in Jesus Christ to make him Lord and Savior of your life. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole world was to be able to come together and recognize 
this unity that goes beyond borders, beyond skin colour, beyond gender, beyond flags, beyond politics, beyond all things, beyond experience of life. We are one in Christ. There is no division. There's no Jew nor Gentile, in my opinion. There's no male or female. There's no black or white. There's no red or yellow. We're just people. And God loves us. I pray that you will be able to see that. I know that most of you wouldn't have any problems. In fact, I don't think there's anybody in the church would have a problem with those equalities. But folks, we've got to learn to demonstrate that. Because there are people that don't understand that we love them. There are some people that look at us and think something other. That's a human response. It's not a spiritual one. So we need to make sure that our spirits drive that out. And remember that Jesus is the friend of sinners, not black sinners, not white sinners, not any word that has to go before sinners, not bad sinners, not good sinners. God loves sinners. He loves people. And the same thing is applies. We don't need to put, he loves Jewish people. He loves Gentile people. He loves black people, or he loves white people, or fat people, or thin people, or men or women he just loves us that's a great leveler isn't it it's a great truth and it's amazing of course i have some questions for you today just a few short ones paul uses the term grace several times in these passages what is it is he referring to what does grace mean and some people will immediately will say something like god revealed at christ's expense and that's true and there's nothing wrong with mnemonics unless you rely on them completely without understanding them. So try and work out what Paul means by grace and how does it apply to you? Have we been given the grace that Paul refers to in this passage? Are you genuinely able to approach God with freedom and confidence as it says in verse 12? As it says in that great hymn, bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown of Christ my own. Wow. Wow. That's some claim, isn't it? Bold I approach the eternal throne. I must be honest with you, folks. Been a Christian a long time, been a minister a long time. But if I think about how I will approach the throne of God when I finally get there, I can't imagine that I'll be bold. But I hope that I'll be confident, even in the sense of my own sin, even though it's been forgotten, even though it's been forgiven and God has poured out his grace on my life. I still imagine that I wouldn't be able to approach him boldly. But my theology tells me that I can. And the Bible tells me that I can. Approach him full of confidence and freedom. My confidence isn't in me. My confidence is in Christ. And if I am able to approach God's presence with boldness or confidence or whatever other word that you want to put in there, it will be because of Jesus. It won't be because of me. And my confidence will be rooted in him. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful today and I hope that you know that you are going to be able to approach the throne of God at all, let alone confidently or boldly. But actually the scripture says that we can be all of those things, bold and confident because we know that we've been forgiven and accepted. But it's still a challenge, isn't it? It's a challenge worth fighting. Be bold, be confident and be secure in your salvation. Amen. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this day we would know what it is to be full of your spirit so that we can live our lives with the boldness and confidence that we are chosen by you, set free by you, objects of love and recipients of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.